Howdy folks, Jabriki here. Last year, I ranked every single Pixar villain, and today, I plan on ranking all of their sidekicks. Let the countdown begin. Chicho and Guido from Luca. The two doting minions of Ekele the Bully are weirdly devoted to this pathetic older boy who picks on little kids. Because teenagers can seem cool and mature to naive younger kids. Oh, and to be fair, Ekele has gained local celebrity as a cyclist. It's kind of impressive how instinctive these two are as Ekele's personal servants. Whether they're jumping straight into action to save their boss's bike, or acting as extra hands for Ekele's cruel abuse of smaller children. Ekele never actually appreciates their dedication though. He just sees his biggest fans as mindless goons that he can casually slap, or exploit as expendable teammates. <laughs> There are differences between these two though. Chicho is clearly the far more loyal and willing minion, while Guido surprisingly has a conscience sometimes. <laughs> Ekele's terrible mistreatment of his only friends does lead to karma though. Once the pair tire of worshipping an ungrateful narcissist and split from their loser of a boss. Good on them for finally finding their self pride and getting out of the bully game before it's too late. Why are they this low on my list though? Well, I don't think they're bad minions. It's just, well, I'm sure that a lot of you don't even remember them existing in Luca. They certainly played their parts as sidekicks, but that's it. They're functional at best and forgettable at worst. Both fading into the background next to Ekele because they're too plain and quiet to keep up with his charismatic presence. Fungus from Monsters Inc. Randall's scaring assistant is a very hard-working right-hand monster. Despite being a super committed sidekick, Randall constantly berates him, and poor Fungus is an anxious mess due to all this abuse. Even though we feel a little sorry for Fungus's poor treatment, he's still a willing co-conspirator in the Screen Machine experiments. Sure, he's mainly taking part out of fear of Randall, but he's still complicit. Randall! Ah, thank goodness! What are we gonna do about the child? Oh, shh! While Mike is a coach of creativity, who gets the best out of Sully through his understanding of scaring as an art, Fungus is a far more technical assistant. Someone who understands monster world technology more than actual scaring. Yes, Randall is the one that created the Scream Extractor, which remains one of Pixar's most nightmarish ideas, but Fungus is clearly an expert on its controls, and knows how to keep up its maintenance as a tech whiz. Please, Fungus. I'm sorry, Wazowski, but Randall said I'm not allowed to fraternize with victims of his evil plot. Interestingly too, Fungus is the only ever victim of the Scream Extractor, and we get to see what horrifying results that this child torch machine can cause. It's messed up that this invention is designed to do the same kind of damage to actual kids. <laughs> It's weird that he's not arrested with the other villains in the end, but at least he seems happier without Randall around anymore, and even gets into the spirit of the factory's new wholesome direction. <coughs> Professor Zundap from Cars 2. In the first Cars sequel, it turns out that British entrepreneur Miles Axelrod is the one behind a scheme to frame natural fuels as dangerous. However, for most of the movie, his minion Professor Zundap serves as the antagonist. And you know what? I think he should have been the actual villain. Miles is a terribly foreshadowed twist baddie who never gets to actually embrace being a villain. While Zundap is this genuinely creepy James Bond style criminal, he's especially unsettling in a scene where he tortures an American agent, all while he coldly explains how said agent is slowly dying. The all in all is now heating to a boil, dramatically expanding causing the engine block to crack under the stress. At the same time though, Zed is observant enough to read the agent's nuanced mannerisms in order to get the info that he needs, only to then let our hero die on screen, all at the hands of a twisted invention cooked up by the professor himself. And kill him. Do you see what I mean? The professor has all the tasty ingredients needed for a great main villain, but Cars 2 just ends up relegating him to the tech geek role. He's remarkably sinister for a minion, but I have to say that he's wasted as a sidekick. The Bensons, from Toy Story 4. Based on the Jerry Mahoney toy line, these ventriloquist dolls act as henchmen to Gabby, serving as her bodyguards and butlers for a mission to steal Woody's voice box. They're a creepy bunch of gangly puppets that walk and move very differently to other toys, or because they don't have puppeteers to prop them up. Plus, they're light-bodied enough to slink, pounce, climb and leap without ever worrying about hurting themselves. Don't let Woody leave. 
There's an aggressive intimidation to them as henchmen. Not only do their angry, laser-eyed expressions signal serious intent, but they can also be quite violent to other toys, to the point in which we actually fear for our heroes breaking. The fact that there's four of them makes their presence even more tense. Every time our heroes sneak around the antique store, they have to be very wary of all four Bensons, and any one of them can pop out like a slasher at any moment. Quiet! You better hope the dummies didn't- These minions might look kind of spooky, but they do surprise us with a redemption in the end. Once Woody and Gabby come to equal terms, one Benson is actually responsible for safely surgically removing Woody's voice box by consent, and another Benson risks himself by acting as a decoy for our hero's escape. All to help their friend Gabby find happiness, which is what the minion ship has always been about. Thumper from A Bug's Life. Hopper's secret weapon is a deeply unhinged and ghostly pale grasshopper that's bound to strike nightmares into kids. He truly is one of the scariest Pixar characters to date. A vicious creature that makes horrible blood curdling sounds and is willing to eat live children. <coughs> you don't like Thumper? Something is clearly wrong with him, but creepily, we never know what condition makes him so rapid, and that ambiguity adds to the horror of his character. With Pixar's early years limited rendering, adding an uncanny eeriness to his design, while he does share space with other grasshoppers, he's treated more like a personal attack dog. I mean, he's very much Hopper's best henchman, so much so that our villain uses Thumper as a tool to effectively demonstrate his lie that ants are weak. All at the expense of the colony's bravest ant, Flick. Not only do Fumpus hits against Flick pack a punch, but he's also heart-poundingly agile too. <laughs> Luckily though, he's knocked down a peg by the biggest circus bug. So you could argue that he can feel fear. You just need the right insect to scare him. Oh, and shout out to Fumpus' very amusing blooper gag in the end credits. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can, can we cut? It's just that I, I don't think I'm coming across. So we're halfway through my list. Who is your favorite Pixar minion and why? Comment with your answer below. Molt, from A Bug's Life. Hopper's dim-witted chatterbox brother is only a minion to his sibling because Hopper promised their mother that he'd spare Molt's life. So Molt ends up being this bumbling goofball who is only part of Hopper's regime out of nepotism, which, in all honesty, is bloody hilarious. Here we have this highly intimidating tyrant, hell-bent on spreading fear, but he's stuck with a big kid for a sidekick. Hey, like the one that nearly ate you, you remember? You remember? Oh, you should have seen it, okay? This blue tank, he has him halfway down his throat, okay? And Hopper, Hopper's kicking and screaming, okay? And I'm scared, okay? I'm not going anywhere near, okay? Oh, come on! It's a great story! Ow, ow, ow. Even the other grasshoppers see Malt as a joke, someone to butter up to gain a say in Hopper's villainy scheme, even though really Malt is just a family idiot. Why go back to Ant Island at all? I mean, you don't even like Grace. What? You're right. I didn't think it was such a good idea myself. Actually, it wasn't even my idea. It was Axel and Locos. They talked fancy to me. I got confused. Mold doesn't even seem that invested in the family business, and really struggles to be as intimidating as his brother. He doesn't seem to belong here at all. He's a comic relief nerd surrounded by tough gangsters. What does get him excited though is the circus. He seems genuinely enthusiastic about the art of traveling entertainment, and sincerely respects everyone who works in the craft. I'm sorry, a magician never reveals his secrets. That's very true, Hoppy. I mean, where would the mystery be if we all know how it was- Shutting up. Which is why it's charming that the fall is spared in the end and gets to join P.T. Flea's troop. It's a career that suits his natural clown-like personality and the push that he needs after breaking from his bullying bossy brother. Big Baby from Toy Story 3. Lotso's longtime friend and right-hand toy is one of the strongest toys in the Toy Story movies. Even though he looks and acts like a real baby, he towers over every other character and is tough enough to overpower all of our heroes. Put him back in the timeout chair. Ah, me. Let's be fair too, baby dolls do have that creep factor to them. They have this uncanny valley vibe to their realism that makes them perfect for ghost stories or spooky movies. Pixar knows this and they create some effective horror from this minion.
However, it's the emotional root of this character that I love the most. You see, he was once lost by his owner, Daisy, and the evil, selfish Lotso convinced Baby that Daisy replaced him. This traumatic heartbreak has led to him hardening himself and growing up way too fast. He was manufactured to help kids develop their nurturing sides, but now he's just this emotionally detached henchman, loyal to the only character that he feels that he can trust. It's only when Woody exposes Lotso's lies, the big baby starts to feel something again. She never loved you, don't be shut up, baby! <laughs> As he stands up to the tyrant who manipulated him and uses his brute strength to dethrone our villain. Uh then, when the credits roll, we see him finally embracing his infant innocence again, with Barbie affectionately giving him the mothering that he's long craved. It's a sweet resolution for Lotso's most tragic abuse victim. Alpha from Up. Charles Muntz's Doberman is the stern leader of the Muntz dog pack. He's such a badass henchman that he gets to call the other dogs his minions. Now that's power. Allow no one to be entering through these doors. Well, that sure, his translator is stuck in helium for a part of the movie, which is funny because it comically ruins his intended menace. Your voice sounds funny! <laughs> 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 But it's a short-lived joke, and his real voice is quite creepy. And will have many enjoyments for what I am about to do, <laughs> He's a very serious canine, who treats his bird-napping mission with the utmost earnestness. He never laughs or expresses emotion, and this icy coldness makes him so harsh. While our hero, Doug, is a cuddly cinnamon roll who craves love and affection from humans, so much so that he betrays the villain's side to protect his new friends, Alpha is a disciplined soldier who is working hard for a madman that's willing to risk his own dog's life to save his reputation. <laughs> Alpha loves to project his own insecurities over letting down others onto Doug. Tomorrow. Come back tomorrow, and then I will again have the bird, yes. Lost it. Why do I not have a surprised feeling? But when sweet Doug outwits the Doberman in the finale, Alpha soon faces his biggest fears, humiliation and failure, with salt rubbed in the wound once Doug unintentionally but deservedly takes his crown. Listen, you dog! <laughs> Shit! Yes, Alpha. Alpha? I am not Alpha. He is... Oh... Mirage from The Incredibles. When a retired superhero, Mr. Incredible, is invited on a mission to a secret island by a beautiful lady called Mirage, he soon learns that it's a trap set up by supervillain Syndrome, who is wiping out every superhero so that he can roleplay as one himself. Mirage is a femme fatale through and through. Her enigmatic mystery and attractive allure is what draws audiences and Mr. Incredible into her character. It seems a bit unstable. I prefer to think of it as misunderstood. <laughs> Aren't we all? Only little details are drip fed about her, but the ambiguity surrounding her is exciting. We learn that she's deeply attracted to power, hence why she's fallen for the wealthy syndrome. Due to her infatuation, she lets syndrome take command of everything and follows his orders down to a T. Although, she is allowed to inject her own identity into her persona. Not only does her minion aesthetic include a warp perspective theme to hint at her deceptiveness, but she also gets to use her own personal research skills against Mr. Incredible. You can still do great things, or you can listen to police scanners. Your choice. It's never clear why she's invested in Syndrome's project, or where her conscience lies in Syndrome's crimes. Heck, her ideals and morals actually clash with Syndrome's? Valuing life is not weakness. Oh, hey, look, look, if you're talking about what happened in the containment unit, I had everything under control. And disregarding it is not strength. So, a big part of me believes that she's only in this game for romantic and financial security. However, she soon learns that shallow attraction will only lead to empty happiness. When Syndrome gambles Mirage's own life to test our hero. Now, go ahead. It'll be easy. Like breaking a toothpick. <laughs> Show me. This revelation on Mirage's part helps her to realize how toxic this relationship actually is. 
and she switches sides behind Syndrome's back. Does she deserve a second chance though? Well, I appreciate the fact that she helps the Incredibles escape Syndrome's lair, and it would be disingenuous to say that she's cold or unfeeling, but she's still an accessory to a murderer and fraud, someone who consciously chose to be bait for targeted superhero victims. Plus, she was willing to risk her life to save Syndrome, even after he showed that he was okay with killing children. Abort! Abort! There are children aboard! Say again, there are children aboard! No! I'm sorry, but there's just too many contradictions and hard crimes on her part for me to casually forgive her as a minion. But I still think that she's one of Pixar's best villain sidekicks. Before I reveal my number one pick, feel free to subscribe to my channel for more fun animation related videos. Thank you. Ken from Toy Story 3. This fashionable doll is a charming romantic who woos Barbie's heart, but it turns out that he's one of Lotso's henchmen. Ken is undoubtedly Pixar's most queer-coded and closeted minion, whether the studio intended him to be or not. I mean, he isn't quiet about how insecure he feels about being a feminine doll. Mr. Softy over here. What do you expect from a girl's toy? I'm not a girl's toy! I'm not! This self-consciousness explains why he's so, so desperate to fit in with Lotso's action figure clique, as he tries hard to look tough next to the other henchmen, and gets weirdly defensive when his masculine authority is challenged. But Lotso, hush now, Kenneth. However, it's Barbie that brings out his more tender side. While every other toy makes cheap wisecracks about Ken's femininity, Barbie accepts Ken for who he is, and genuinely appreciates his sensitive masculinity. You have everything! Everything, except someone to share it with. Ken foolishly fails to treasure her though, as he pathetically lets his pitiful need to seem tough to Lotso's crew repress his natural emotions and true self. Okay, but things are complicated around here. You gotta do what I say. I will, Ken. I promise. Then when Barbie later outwits Ken through her own feminine strengths, Ken's macho ego is deflated, and he breaks out of Lotso's toxic trance, finally expressing his real feelings about the Teddy's regime. Everyone, listen! Sunnyside could be cool and groovy if we treated each other fair. It's Lotto. He's made us into a pyramid. Once the daycare is fascism free, Ken embraces his doll's 60s love roots and at long last lets his glittery true self shine loud with pride. Next you can watch my ranking of every Disney minion, from Anastasia to Kronk. I've been Jambariki. Cheerio folks. <laughs> <laughs>